those old, old Testament battles, the Old Testament violence that we see, and even, even the harsh punishments that, that God gives to his people at times. They tell me they're, they're ready to move on to the New Testament so that we can focus on the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to be honest with you, when, when someone new comes to the faith, and I've mentioned this before, but when someone new comes to the faith, you know, I, I don't have them start back in Genesis. <laughs> I don't have them start by reading all those wars of the, <clears throat> of the Old Testament. I don't have them start by reading those, those harsh punishments that God lays upon His people. Rather, I, I, I start in the New Testament, I start with Jesus, because I, I want them to know Jesus. And I want them to know his story. As people who are new to the faith, or maybe as someone who is interested about the faith. But here's the thing, as, as we mature in our faith, I think it's only natural to want to know the rest of the story. As we mature in our faith, I, I think it's important to, to know what the prophets foretold I think it's important to see the promises God gave to his people. I think it's important to look at how the Israelites messed up so that we can learn from history and hopefully we don't mess up. And that's why we're doing the story. That's why we started in, in Genesis. So we know the rest, the rest of the story. It's kind of kind of like being a, a Star Wars fan. I love Star Wars. Anybody else love Star Wars? Star Wars geeks. There's a few hands out there. I was about, I was about seven years old when, when Star Wars first came out. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I mean, well, I'll be 44 this ju uh, July, but to think I was seven when this movie came out, and they're actually making number seven in the series that will be released next year. So they're still making these movies. But I remember when it first came out, and, and if you know anything about Star Wars, you know this. They didn't start with episode one, did they? No. What episode did they start with? Four. They started with episode four because they wanted you to get emotionally attached to Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. But if you're a Star Wars fan, absolutely you wanted to go back and see the rest of the story to see how Darth Vader became Darth Vader, to see how Luke Skywalker became Luke Skywalker. And yes, I want to give people Jesus. But there are times when we need to look back, and that's what we've been doing. But if you're ready to move on, don't worry. Come this fall, we're going to be looking at the New Testament. And it's actually 10 weeks. It's a 10-week sermon series on the New Testament. And really, for the most part, it focuses upon the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. You know, most of the New Testament, New Testament is made up of writings by Paul, but really they, they, they summarize his writings in, in two chapters. So for the most part, it is about Jesus. And I just want to tell you, if you have a neighbor, if you have a friend that doesn't know Jesus, this fall is going to be a great time to invite them. Now, any week is a great time. I mean, if you're blessed by worship, I'm sure other people will be blessed. So bring them any time to church. But if you have someone in mind that really doesn't know Jesus or, or they just need a little shot in the arm and a little encouragement to accept him, bring them this fall as we, as we look at the New Testament. From the Gospels, from Matthew, all the way to, to Revelation. But as we, as we make this transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and over the summer we'll be doing different things, but as we make this transition, I just want to lift this up to you this morning. And this is what I really want to focus on. And that is this truth, it's this fact, that God, <clears throat> that God does not change. The same God of the, of the Old Testament, the same God who reigned during those wars, the same God who reigned during the, those times of violence, the same God who, who punished his people in the Old Testament, that's the same God who reigned when Jesus was born, that's the same God who reigns today. In the last book of the Old Testament, you might know the last book of the Old Testament? Malachi, thank you. Um, I didn't notice a rousing <laughs> answer to that, but Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. 
And uh, I want to read to you from Malachi. Because I think even the prophet Malachi needed to reassure the people um, that God never changes. This is Malachi chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. And this is the Lord speaking. I, the Lord, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. I want to look at three qualities of God that, that never changes. Three aspects of God that was the same 2,000 years ago, as it is today, as it will be 2,000 years from now. Three aspects of God that, that simply do not change. Number one, everything God does, he does out of love. Everything God does, he does out of love. Even when he was punishing those Israelites way back in the Old Testament, God was doing it out of love. You've got to remember, back when the, the Israelites first formed as a people, there weren't a whole lot of them, comparatively speaking, to the other nations. And this was a hard-hearted set of folks. These were people who would chase after any God. And if God wasn't harsh with them at times, I am sure there would have been no longer a people called the people of Israel. They would have left God long ago. Sometimes the only reason they remained a people, sometimes the only reason they followed God was out of fear. I'm not, I'm not saying that's the best way to do things, but sometimes that's the way you got to do it. If you, want, if you want them to survive. If you, have a, if you have a child that keeps running out in the middle of the road, right? And if spanking that child is the only way you're going to keep them from running out in the road, guess what? I hope you spank your child. I mean, if that's the only way from keeping them from going out into the road, then you do what you got to do. It's much better for them to get a spanking than for them to get hit by a car. I think of my own childhood and, and the way my mom punished me, you know, um, it changed over the years. When I was a kid, my mom spanked me. And it was always, you know, and I may have told you this, but it was always, you know, this is going to hurt me more than you. She'd always tell me that. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, if, if that's really true, why are you using dad's belt, you know? Because that belt hurts. My dad never spanked me, but I had an intimate relationship with his belt. So when I was a kid, my mom spanked me with my dad's, my dad's leather belt. But as I grew older, the punishments changed. When I, was in, when I was in high school, I no longer received spankings. My mom would just ground me from those things I enjoyed doing, which was fairly effective. And then I remember moving away from home. I went to, to college down in Mississippi, so I was about 750 miles away from my mom. There's no way she could spank me. There's no way, you know, really she could even ground me. I was 750 miles away. But to this day, I remember being down in college, and I remember uh, following, you know, the, the correct path, not getting too far off the path I was supposed to be on. Not because I was scared of receiving a punishment, but because I did not want to disappoint my mother. That's why I stayed on the, the straight and narrow I did not want to disappoint my mom. Now you see, my mom's love for me never changed. My mom's love for me always stayed, stayed the same, but the punishment changed as I changed. And when you look at the Bible, the way God treats us changes, not because he changes, but because we change. God needed to be harsh with the people when they first formed as a nation, but you see, especially in the New Testament, there is this group of followers, this group of, of people who have such devout faith that they are willing to follow God anywhere and do anything because they know that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because they know that He gave them His Son to die on a cross. 
You know, those early followers, those early disciples, they were Jews. They belonged to the people of God, but at the right moment, at the right time, God sent Jesus because God knew they would listen. And starting with those disciples, starting with those followers, they ended up changing the world. So you see, it's not that God changes. We change. And God speaks to us, God speaks to our hearts uh, where we are at. The first, first quality of God that doesn't change, God is a God of love. And everything he does, he does out of love. Second quality of God that does not change, God is always in control. God is always in control. Even when things seem to, to fall apart, God is in control. Even when we mess up, God is in control. Even when our nation messes up, God is still in control. Nothing, nothing can stop the plan that God has as recorded in Revelation. Nothing can stop the fact that one day Satan is defeated. Nothing can stop God's ultimate plan that one day he will create a new heaven and a new earth. Nothing can stop that. But we have a choice of whether or not we want to be a part of it. And while God has a plan for each and every one of our lives, we are not the plan. Like God has a plan for this nation. This nation is not the plan. So that if we mess up, God's plan is still going to go into fruition. If this nation messes up, God will still get his work accomplished. But the question remains whether or not we want to be a part of it whether our nation wants to be a part of it. In the book of Esther, Esther is faced with a dilemma, a life or death, a life or death situation. She can go before the king, which might mean the king killing her, but if she's success, successful, she will save the Jewish people, or she can just play it easy. Just kind of stay in the background and hope things work out for the best. Well, this is really a tough decision whether or not she wanted to risk her life. And so a relative of hers by the name of Mordecai comes to her. And Mordecai says to Esther, he says, and this is Esther chapter 4 verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. God's ultimate plan is going to come to fruition. Do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to, to reach out to others? And invite them to be a part of it. To be a part of this blessing that God has given to us. Always remember, regardless of what is going on in your life, regardless of what is going, going on in this nation or this world, God is in control. A final aspect of God that I want to look at is this. God is holy. And nothing can change that. Holiness means to be set apart, and in this terms with God, it means God is set apart from sin. God and sin simply do not mix. God can't stand sin. It's a little bit like, and this is an analogy that falls apart very quickly if you think about it too long, but it's, it's kind of like me and uh, black-eyed peas. Not those black-eyed peas, the vegetable. Those black-eyed peas. I can't stand black-eyed peas. I almost have a phobia of black-eyed peas. I mean, forget about just eating them. I don't like to be in the same room with them. Unfortunately, my grandmother, who is now deceased, she always got me and my younger brother mixed up. And my younger brother loves black-eyed peas, so I'd go to visit, and she'd have this big pot of black-eyed peas boiling. But even then, I'd tell my grandma, I said, I can't eat black-eyed peas. 
When I was 10, 11 years old, growing up in LaPorte County, we're in the middle of the country. One day I went out back and I looked on the ground. And there was a black eyed pea. And again, I was about 10 years old, so I, you know, I, was a little, I was a little curious back then. And I don't know why I decided to pick it up. It's just a black eyed pea. But uh, I decided to pick it up. So there's, there's this black eyed pea on the ground, so I picked it up and looked at it. And then I turned it over, and all of a sudden, all these legs started to wiggle. <laughs> Come to find out, it was no black eyed pea. It was a bloated tick. Which, if you think about it, laying in the ground, kind of looks like a black eyed pea. But ever since then, I, ca I cannot eat black eyed peas. I, I mean, I don't even like to look at them because I think of those little legs that sprouted and started to move around. I can't stand black eyed peas. I don't like to be around black eyed peas. Well, again, this analogy falls, falls apart very quickly if you think about it, but God can't stand to be around sin. God is the opposite of sin. God is perfect and holy and righteous. God can't stand to be around sin, and the only way we can have a relationship with God, with a holy God, is if our sins are removed. And thank God that God gave us a way to remove them. Not by anything we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. We can be free of sin. We can be free of death because when Jesus was nailed to the cross, not only was his flesh and blood nailed there, but so were our sins. And by his blood, we are made clean. By his blood, we can stand before God and have a relationship with him, a relationship with this holy God because of what Jesus has done for us. And again, we'll talk a lot more about this in the fall. But we have a holy God who invites us to be a part of his kingdom through his son, Jesus Christ. So as we finish up this, this portion of the story, I just want to ask you, which, which quality of God do you need to focus on at this moment? What quality of God do you need to be reassured by so that regardless of what you're going through, you can keep your, your eyes on Jesus? Maybe you feel unloved. Maybe you feel as if you're not being taken care of. Or maybe you feel as if nobody cares. Then I pray that you will know the unconditional love and grace of God through Jesus. That love that never changes, that love that continually invites you to him. As, as, uh, as Micah tells us, return to me, says the Lord, and I will return to you. It's as simple as reaching a hand out to God. So if you feel unloved, I just pray that you may know the unconditional love of God. Maybe you've come this morning and your world is like in chaos. Everything is out of control. You don't know how ends are going to meet Maybe you're having problems at work. Maybe there's a relationship that's broken. I don't know, but you have come and your life seems to be spinning out of control. Then I pray that you may know the God who is always in control. He is in control of this world. He's in control of this nation. He's in control of your life. Know that peace that passes all understanding. Or maybe you've come and you've got that, that unresolved sin that sin that keeps weighing down your heart. Well, I just pray that you may know that God sent his son to die on a cross for you. That you don't have to carry that weight any longer. Jesus has broad shoulders. Jesus has reached out his hands so that you don't have to carry that sin any longer. So if that's you, I just pray that you give it over to Christ Jesus so that you can have a relationship with this holy, with this holy God. This God, this God who never, ever changes. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for your love, for your grace. We thank you that you are always in control. We thank you for your holiness and for the salvation that comes through Jesus. Dear God, bring us closer to you today. May we hear what we need to hear. May we feel loved. May we know your peace. May we know the cleansing power of Jesus' blood. For God, as, as we gather as a nation to celebrate Independence Day, we, we gather as a church to remember the freedoms we have through Jesus. Freedom over sin. Freedom over death. For God, we thank you for these many things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song?